any canoeing? Uh, yeah, I know you have Brandy. I've got a video of you flipping one. So, uh, <laughs> you know, back when I was a freshman in college, I, the guy that lived in the room next door to me at the dorm, his name was, was Engine. Uh, his name was actually Daryl, but he was half Navajo. And that was back in the old days before political correctness. And, and he went by the name Engine. That's the name he chose for himself because he was half Navajo. So it was Engine, I N J U N not E-N-G-I-N-E. -E. At first I thought he was a gearhead, and then I found out, no, he's an engine. So anyway, and we played cowboys and Indians. Anyway, uh, he and I became real good friends, and we spent a lot of time together, did a lot of hunting. And one year during our winter break, or Christmas break, from college, we kind of planned this big hunting trip. My older brother and I were gonna drive over to Engine's uh, parents' home in Quinlan, Texas, over by Dallas, and we were gonna spend a couple of days duck hunting on Lake Tawakening. Then we were driving to Cleburne, Texas, to meet another friend of mine. We were gonna do some dove hunting, and then we were all gonna end up back in Sonora and do some oh. deer hunting. Now, I grew up hunting deer, and I hunted quail a few times, but I had never hunted ducks before. Had no idea about this duck hunting stuff. Come to find out it has a lot to do with water, okay? Uh, when I got there, when we got to Quinlan that night, or that evening, uh, Engine was out in the garage patching some waders for me, because I've never duck hunt, I didn't have any waders, and so he's patching a set of waders for me, chest waders, with a hot glue gun. Now, I want to tell you, that doesn't work, okay? They still leak, and water that's 32 degrees is very cold. I learned that. So that night we get to Quinlan and we go out to uh, to this lake and, and I don't remember exactly how all of this transpired. I just know that we are on one side of the lake and when we get ready to leave, Engine tells us he's got a canoe there that he needs paddled back across to the other side of the lake. And so he, my, my brother and I got volunteered to paddle this canoe across the lake. Now it's getting evening, it's kind of dusk, and he said, do you see those lights over there? And I mean, they were way over there. And I said, yeah, and he said, he said, just head to those lights, and I'll meet you in the pickup just to the left of the lights. Now, I've never done a whole lot of canoeing, but it can't be that difficult, right? And so we get in the canoe and we take off. And we're paddling, and as the longer we paddle, the darker it gets, because the sun was setting. And before long, it's just pitch black, except we can see those lights over there. And then the wind starts to pick up, blowing right into our faces. And we paddle, and we paddle, and we paddle. And we paddle. And finally I turned to my brother and I said, are we getting any closer to the lights at all? He said, I really can't tell, but we can't stop now. And so we kept paddling. And I mean, it seemed like forever. And as I'm going on, I'm beginning to think, this guy may not be as good a friend as I think he is. <laughs> Believe me, when I got there, we had some cowboy and Indian discussions, you know. I mean, but we finally did make it. We parked the canoe and got it ready for the next day of hunting. But... This week, when I was reading through 2 Peter chapter 1, and that's where we are this morning, I forgot to look up the page number in the Brown Pew Bible. Uh, if somebody will turn to there and, and tell me what page that's on in the Brown Pew Bible. That way you can all turn there. 2 Peter chapter 1 is on page 860. Thank you. As I was reading through... 2 Peter chapter 1 this week, I kept picturing in my mind this rowing a canoe across the lake against a wind that keeps wanting to blow you back to shore. Because I think in some ways that's kind of the picture that we get here as we start, start reading through this. And so I want you to read with me the first couple of verses. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. We did verses 1 and 2 last week. But it begins in verse 3 and it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. And through these He has given us His very great and precious promises 
so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. I really appreciate, Greg, what you had to say up here for the Lord's Supper and the prayers that went with the Lord's Supper and our remembrance in this time of what He has done for us. And that's what Peter kind of starts off with, is, is reminding us of everything that He has done to save us by His own goodness and glory. The perfect life that Jesus lived on this world to save me and to save you. And by His glory, Him being nailed to a cross, which was not glory, being put into a tomb, which was not glory, but Him being raised from the dead for me and for you. To prove to us that, guys, there is eternal life. I've got something better for you. And in fact, I've made it happen. I've guaranteed it for you. It's there. And in this picture, I, I get this picture in my head of Jesus. You know, we're all standing on this beach. We're all standing on this shoreline of this world that you and I live in. And it's a world filled with corruption and evil desires and lustful desires and things that are, are headed straight to hell. And while we're on this side, on this shore, in this land, this land was taking us right there with it. We were just kind of lost. We were just following along with everything else until we met Jesus and until we came to know Him. And then He provided us a way. He said, guys, you don't have to be in this world. This does not have to be your destiny. You see, in our lives, there really is only two options. One is we stay with this world and we go down in a blazing fire. Or we leave this world and we go to a heavenly shore where we live with no pain and no suffering, no tears, and spend eternity with God the Father. Problem is, because we lived in this world, we're full of sin. But Jesus came and He lived a perfect, godly, good life and died to wash me of my sins. And it's like Jesus has now said, Okay, Lance, you don't have to live in this world anymore. This world is not your home. And so He takes me down to this shore and He puts me in a canoe. And in this canoe, He is equipped it with everything I need to get to where I'm going. In fact, that's what Peter says here. Uh, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. There's where you're going so that through them you may participate. Uh, and in verse 3, he says, he, through his divine power, he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. And so picture that that you've, you've come to Jesus, you've been buried with Him in baptism, you've had your sins washed away, He's put you in this canoe, and He's kind of shoved you out away from the shore. And, and He's pointed you in the right direction. You see that light? You see that golden shore over there? That's where you're headed. Problem is, so often, once we get shoved off like that, we just kind of coast. We think, wow, this is awesome. I've been freed from my sins. I'm in the boat. I'm headed to that golden shore. I'm just going to sit back and enjoy the ride. The problem is the wind comes up and begins to blow us back towards the land that we've left. And people on the shore that we left start yelling for us, Hey, come on back. We're having a party tonight. Come on, you're missing some stuff. And if we don't keep making an effort to move away from the shore we left, we might end up drifting back. And that's what Peter gets into next. In verse 5, he says, For this very reason, make every effort. And, and I, I, I wish, I wish that that it would translate a little firmer. And I don't really know how to, how to do that, but, but I think it, 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 there's more of an emphasis than, than just do your very best, uh, make every effort. Uh, one of the translations that I looked at said, 
uh, do your best in all earnestness. You know, I remember when, when our kids were little and we gave them chores to do, one of the chores was they had to make their bed. And I remember once going into the room and the, the bed was just a mess. And I said, didn't you make the bed? I did. I said, the bed's not made. And she said, well, you told me to do the best I could. That's the best I could do. And I'm like, no, that ain't the best you could do. But I told her to do the best you could do, and she said that was the best you could do. And, so you, and, and, and I think sometimes when we get this in our head, you know, we we'll make every effort, do the best you can, but it's beyond that. It's do the best you can in all diligence, putting every effort into it. It's not just, well, I gave it a, gave it a try. It's, man, you've got to work for this. You've got to make this happen. You've got to set the oars into the water, and you've got to pull, and you've got to row, and you've got to keep working in this area. And we're going to see when he gets to the end why this is so important. But in verse 5 he says, For this reason, because of everything that God has done for you, because He's washed you clean, because He sent His Son to die, because He has bought you out of darkness and brought you into the kingdom of the Son He loved, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And He's going to give a list of things that you've got to work on. We start with faith. He gives this list, and lists were very, very normal. Uh, everybody wrote about and gave lists of how to live. His list begins with faith and it ends with love. And those are the two things that sets it apart as a very Christian list. Even though he uses other words that the pagans used all the time in their religious setting, we know this is about Christian stuff because it begins with our faith. And he's already told us in verses 1 and 2 that God gave us this faith. It's something that we have. We know Jesus we know what He's done for us, and that's what brings us into this saving relationship. And then He ends His list with love, which we all know that's kind of the thing that holds everything together for Christians. Jesus said, a new command, I give you love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. And so His list begins with faith. That's where we start. It ends with love. And He says, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And if you go back up into verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Another way to translate that word for goodness would be moral excellence. Jesus lived a morally excellent life. And church, you and I are to add to our faith moral excellence. We are to be like Jesus was in every way that we act, in every way we think, in every way we behave. We are to be molded into His image. And Peter says, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and that goodness is like the goodness of Jesus Christ. And to add to your goodness, knowledge. Well, how are we going to know of Jesus' goodness if we don't know Jesus? And so add to your goodness knowledge. You need to understand and know more about who Jesus is and about how God is. We were talking about this in our Bible study this morning, in our Sunday morning Bible class, the importance of our knowledge and knowing who God is. And the only way we know that is through His Word. And so we need to add to our goodness knowledge. And then to knowledge, He said, self-control. That's the ability to say, I'm not going to do that because that is wrong and that is not what Jesus would do. That is not what God desires me to do. And so every, even though everything in me wants to do it, I'm going to exercise and I'm going to make every effort to have self-control in my life. And then to self-control perseverance. That's that stick to itiveness that says, I'm going to remain faithful to God. I'm going to remain heading in the right direction regardless of the wind, regardless of the trials, regardless of the temptation, regardless of whatever else is going on around me. I'm going to keep moving towards that shore. And then to perseverance, godliness. 
There's not a whole lot of difference between godliness and goodliness if we understand that what we're supposed to do is become just like Jesus. Everything we need to do has to be motivated by how God is. And we make every effort to add that to our lives. And to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. And when you look at that, the word brotherly kindness could be translated brotherly love, but then why does he say love after he says brotherly love? And I think what Peter is emphasizing is, you guys in the church, you're all family. And you need to always make sure you remember that you are family. You're brothers and sisters. And you need to treat one another in a certain way. Always. And you need to be adding to this and growing this, making every effort, every diligence to get better at this. And then to brotherly kindness, love. Which just surrounds and glues everything together. To love one another. Because if we don't love, we really don't know God. Because God is love, according to John. And so it's about making every effort to add these things to your life. It's not just about, okay, you're in the boat and we shoved you off, and now you're just cruising along. No, now you've got to do something. And, and we get this, and we see it so clearly when we pick up in verse 8. He says, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure... Now, he doesn't just say, if you possess these qualities, you're good to go. He says, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, which means you have to be growing in them. And if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. And therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, if you keep paddling, and if you keep making every effort to add to your faith these things and grow in the way that you're supposed to, you'll reach that shore. But if you don't, if you don't make every effort to add these things to your life, you may not. You may be blown back and drift back into the same darkness that you escaped. And that's the people that Peter is writing to, that's the fear that, that he has for them. Because there are people coming in trying to teach them, you know what, there's never going to be any judgment. I mean, come on, 2,000 years now we've waited for Jesus to show up and he's never done it. You really think it's going to happen now? I mean, nothing's ever really changed. There's never really been any judgment. Evil people prosper. Good people suffer. There's not going to be any judgment. Just live the way you want to. And that's the temptation for these early Christians is to just go back to that old life. In church, that same temptation is there for us. That same danger is there for us. Now I want to spend just a minute here looking at verse eight or verse 9. He says, but if anyone does not have them, does not have these things in an increasing measure, He's nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past. And, and it, the question that comes up is, you know, Peter says this person's nearsighted and blind. Well, I tell you what, I've been nearsighted. Before I had my corrective surgery, I was nearsighted. I couldn't see this far in front of me, clearly. So I know what it is to be nearsighted. But I don't know what it's like to be blind. Blind is something totally different. Blind is as bad as you can get, right? So why does Peter say nearsighted and blind? Why doesn't he just say that person's blind? 
And so the scholars who look at this, that word that's translated nearsighted, this is the only place it comes up in the New Testament. It doesn't come up very often in any other Greek, ancient Greek writings or anything. And so they're kind of left trying to figure out what does this word really mean. And based on the etymology, how the word is put together, some scholars say that it means that they close their eyes or they blink their eyes. But another guy, another scholar, who seems to actually be more up on Second Peter than any other, says it's really not about blinking their eyes and closing their eyes. It's that they screw their eyes up to try to see better. You guys remember Rob Frazier? Do you ever notice how Rob would do that till he got his glasses? He'd do like this when he'd be looking at something. Hey, Rob, if you're watching this, we love you, man. We're thinking of you. And I know some of you do this. I've seen you in restaurants when you get the menu and you'll do like this. And I think maybe that's what he's talking about here. It's not just so much that they're nearsighted. It's that they're screwing up their eyes trying to see clearly. And here's why. Because they know the truth is that's the golden short. That's where you're headed. But here are these people coming in saying, but you don't need to keep rowing that canoe. Just live the way you want to. You'll eventually get over there. But they know in their minds that that's not true. And so they have to screw up their eyes to try to distort their vision enough that they can see the lie. Peter tells us, church, we need to keep our eyes focused on where Christ has set us in motion to. We don't drift there. We work diligently to keep adding to our faith these things. Because if we don't, we drift back to shore. I've seen people who have drifted back, and you've seen people who have drifted back. And that's why it's so important that we make every effort to put these things into practice and to add to our faith these things that have been listed here. Peter's dealing with Christians who are about to be led astray by false teachers. People telling them, you really don't have anything to worry about. And our world is filled with people telling us, ah, you don't have anything to worry about. Church, the temptation is too strong for and so today, we need to make the decision, you know what, it's time for me to get the paddle out of the canoe and start working. I've been drifting in this faith for long enough, but it's time to start moving in the right direction. It's time to make that commitment to paddle away from the shores of this world and head where we need to be going. Now, some of you here may have never taken that first step. Maybe you've never been washed clean of the dirt and the filth and the sin of this world. And you need to do that today. Maybe you did that at one point in time, but you've really never done anything else to grow your faith since then. And today you need to make that commitment to do so. <coughs> Part of doing that is sharing with the rest of the church family, you know what, I need to be putting more effort into this. And I need you guys to show that brotherly kindness to me and come alongside me and help me to get where I need to be. And so in just a moment, we're going to stand up. Ken is going to lead us in a song. And as he does, if you're here this morning and you need help paddling your canoe, or maybe you need to learn, how do I, how do I get a canoe? Then we're going to give you a chance to come up. You can talk to me. I'll, I'll try to answer any questions you've got. We as a church family will pray for you. We'll do whatever we can to help you stay moving towards that goal. And not be blown back into the corruption of this world. So if there's anything we can do to help you, Please come forward and let us know while we stand and sing this song.